So far we've been discussing general techniques for solving partial differential equations using the finite difference method. We've discussed elliptic partial differential equations, we've discussed parabolic PDs that progress in time, and now we're ready to focus specifically on the Navier-Stokes equations that govern fluid mechanics. So this is computational fluid mechanics. We're going to start by talking about various formulations of the Navier-Stokes equations that govern fluid mechanics. We'll discuss why we might favor one formulation over another and where the advantages and disadvantages for each lie. And then we'll move into a more detailed discussion about grids, grid generation, turbulent flows, and how they're modeled, and so forth. So first I'm going to discuss what's known as the primitive variables formulation. It's called primitive not because it's really old, but because it's the, the form of the Navier-Stokes equations that we're most familiar with, that we're used to with using the primitive variables, velocities, and pressures that, that govern fluid mechanics. So an incompressible flow of a Newtonian fluid Newtonian just means that there's a direct linear relationship between the stress and the strain rate in the fluid. So most gases and most liquids under normal circumstances obey the Newtonian fluid approximation. And these are the Navier-Stokes equations. So we have the momentum equation and the continuity equation. Essentially the momentum equation is mass times acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces, Newton's second law. So on the left you have the mass in the form of density, mass per unit volume. Then you have the acceleration. So this is an acceleration in what's called an Eulerian frame. So an Eulerian frame means you're sitting at one point in the flow and you're watching the fluid come by. In dynamics, we're used to a Lagrangian framework where you're following the particles around. And that's why acceleration now has this additional V dot del V term in addition to the partial V partial T term. Then on the right is the sum of the forces. We have forces due to pressure and forces due to viscosity or friction in the flow. Then we have the continuity equation, which is just a fancy term for conservation of mass. Mass has to be conserved, and if it's incompressible, that means it's not expanding or contracting. The mathematical measure that quantifies the expansion or contraction of a vector field is the divergence, del dot, of the vector field. If it's not expanding or contracting because it's incompressible, then the divergence is equal to zero. Now I put stars in all these variables to indicate that these are the dimensional versions of these equations. We'll non-dimensionalize on the next slide. All right, so that's the basic formulation in compact vector form. We'll, we'll write it all out in non-vector form shortly. So we have some physical quantities such as the density, viscosity, mu over here in the viscous terms, and then we have our dependent variables, pressure, and then the u, v, and w velocities in the x, y, and z directions respectively. And that's what comprises the velocity vector v star. All right, so it's common in fluid mechanics and heat transfer to non-dimensionalize. And I'll show you just in one slide how we do that and actually why we do that. So we want to get the dimensionality out of the problem. All the independent variables, all the dependent variables, all of the physical parameters within the Navier-Stokes equations have dimensions. So we want to non-dimensionalize that. So to do that, we would take our spatial dimensions, for example, x, y, and z, and if we divide by a characteristic length scale, some length scale that's characteristic of the particular problem, and we could divide by that length scale, and that would give us a non-dimensional, dimensionless spatial coordinates, x, y, and z, and so without the stars. Velocity, similarly, we take the physical velocity, divide by some characteristic velocity that's characteristic of the particular flow that we're analyzing, divide by that, and we have a non-dimensional velocity. To non-dimensionalize time, we take the characteristic length scale divided by the characteristic velocity scale, which gives us a characteristic time scale to non-dimensionalize. Now pressure, you may remember from an undergraduate fluid mechanics class that there's different types of pressure, statics pressures, dynamic pressures. So we use the dynamic pressure, which is one half rho u squared, to non-dimensionalize the pressure. It's actually two times, so we don't have the one half there. So two times the dynamic pressure, that has the units of pressure, and it's characteristic of the particular flow, so we use that to non-dimensionalize the pressure. So now when we rewrite our Navier-Stokes equations in terms of all these non-starred, all these non-dimensional variables, notice what happens. So here's that same momentum equation. You have the time derivative, the v dot del v term, just like before, minus the gradient of the pressure, and then you have your viscous terms. But you'll notice the rho is gone, the mu is gone, all of the physical parameters have been wrapped up into a single non-dimensional parameter known as the Reynolds number. And that's defined here. It's rho ul over mu. It's non-dimensional, 
if you look at the units of all of these quantities, they all cancel out. And we have a non-dimensional number that characterizes all this physical and geometric information about our particular problem. And then we also have, of course, continuity or conservation of mass, del dot v is equal to zero. One thing you'll notice is as the Reynolds number gets bigger, the influence of the convection terms on the right-hand side become more prominent. And you'll notice that's where the nonlinearity is. I'll show this in the next slide more explicitly. But the v dot del v, those are the nonlinear terms that we've discussed before with not up and down differencing and, and so forth. So those nonlinear terms become more prominent as the Reynolds number increases. As you may remember, as the Reynolds number goes up, your flow is more likely to be turbulent, messy, and much more complicated. And that's because of this nonlinearity becoming more and more prominent. So let's look at the 2D Cartesian form of the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. So we have our x momentum and y momentum in the two spatial dimensions. So here's the acceleration, acceleration. Then we have a pressure gradient at x, pressure gradient at y, and then we have the viscous terms on the right-hand side as well. You'll notice for the x momentum equation, the primary dependent variable is u, which is the velocity component in the x direction, whereas that in the y momentum is v, which is the velocity component in the y direction. And of course, pressure comes in as well. They both have their 1 over Reynolds number multiplied by the viscous terms. Then continuity, remember that's del dot v, 2D Cartesian coordinates. That's partial u partial x plus partial v partial y is equal to zero. Again, that's enforcing conservation of mass. And you'll notice if I get rid of these terms, that's just the 2D unsteady diffusion equation that we looked at in chapter six when we looked at multidimensional parabolic partial differential equations. So now we're adding in both the nonlinear term as well as the pressure gradient term. So that's going to add some additional complexity, of course, as compared to that 2D unsteady diffusion equation. But we're going to use very similar methods to solve this. But so again, you see it has this parabolic character because of the time derivative, as well as this elliptic character because of the Laplacian on the right-hand side. All right, so let's just think about what we have here. We have three equations for three unknowns, u, v, and p, the two velocity components, u and v in the x and y directions, and then the pressure. So three equations, three unknowns. Everything looks fine. The first equation, as I said a moment ago, that's essentially an equation for the variable u. So if I know p and I know v, I could solve 7.1 for u. Likewise, the y momentum equation is essentially an equation for v. If I knew p and u, I could solve 7.2 for v. So then, I just need an equation for pressure. Well, of course I don't have that. Uh, pressure doesn't even show up in the continuity equation. So that's the first issue that we have, is we do have a closed system mathematically, three equations for three unknowns, but I don't have an equation I could solve directly for pressure. So this is what I just said. So we have our primitive variables, u, v, and p. 7.1 is for u, 7.2 is for v, and 7.3 is not for pressure. So we need an equation for the pressure in terms of u and v. So if I know u and v from the other two equations, then I could solve for the pressure. So I essentially need to replace the continuity equation with an equation for pressure that I can solve. So the way to get an equation for pressure is the following. If you take the divergence of the Navier-Stokes equation, so if you take that vector form of the Navier-Stokes equations that we had at the beginning, and take the divergence of that, so del dot those equations, then you will get the equation I'm going to show you. That's equivalent in two dimensions to taking partial partial x of the x momentum equation and partial partial y of the y momentum equation and then adding them together. And let me show you how that works. So here I've done that. I've taken those partial derivatives and I've added them together. You'll notice I've put the pressure terms on the left hand side. So these were minus partial p partial x minus partial p partial y. We took additional derivatives with respect to x and y to get second derivatives on the pressure. So this is a Laplacian, a del squared of the pressure. Then on the right-hand side is everything involving u's and v's. You can see it's pretty messy, but you notice here's the time derivative terms, the unsteady terms. Here are the viscous terms. Any, anything with the 1 over Reynolds number times that, those are the viscous terms. And then everything else, those are the terms that come from taking partial partial x and partial partial y of the nonlinear convection terms in both of those equations.
because of all the product rules, we get a whole bunch of terms. Now let me colorize these terms to make it clear what I'm about to do. So here's exactly the same equation that I just showed you. All I've done is I've colored these unsteady terms red, these U terms green, these V terms blue, and so on. And I'll show you why that is. So let's take these unsteady terms first. So I have partial partial T of partial U partial X, and I have partial partial T of partial V partial Y. So I've rewritten that in this form down here. Similarly, for the green terms, I have u partial, partial x of partial u partial x, and u times partial partial x of partial v partial y. So when I write that down here, you have those two terms. Similarly for the blue. So v partial partial y of partial u partial x plus partial v partial y. Now hopefully you can see where this is going. You'll notice that in parentheses, in every single one of these terms so far, we have partial u partial x plus partial v partial y. Well, where have we seen that before? Right here. That's the continuity equation. That's equal to zero. So all of these equations that have this in them, those are all zero. Now in the middle here, I have these black terms. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Uh, those are given here unchanged. Just combine two of them together. And then the viscous terms, one over the Reynolds number, and then, I don't know, what color is that? Is that brown? So I have partial squared partial x squared of partial u partial x, and here I have partial squared partial x squared of partial v partial y. So that I've written down here. Again, that involves the divergence of the velocity field. That zero and goes away. Similarly, for these, yeah, I don't know, purple. So there I have partial squared partial y squared of partial u partial x, and partial squared partial y squared of partial v partial y. And those are right here. And again, those terms go away. So all these terms go away. All these terms go away because of continuity. And I'm just left with these three terms here. So I've repeated that here. Now you also notice from the continuity equation, I can rewrite these terms that remain in a slightly different form. So partial u partial x squared is equal to partial v partial y squared because of continuity and that's then equal to minus partial u partial x partial v partial y. So with that, I can rewrite these two terms along with this term into this final form. So this is a Poisson equation. It's Laplacing on the left for the pressure, and then I have a known right-hand side. If I know u and I know v, I can evaluate the right-hand side of equation 7.4, and I have a Poisson equation. Now we know how to solve Poisson equations. That's an elliptic partial differential equation. It's linear, and we know the techniques for solving that. So in the end, what we have are equations 7.1 and 7.2, those x and y momentum. Those are parabolic in time for the unsteady case. So we could use Crank-Nicholson, we could use ADI, we could use factored ADI, and so on. And then for this equation, which replaces our continuity equation, we have a pressure Poisson equation, which is an elliptic equation that we're going to solve for the pressure. And we could use any of our elliptic solvers, cyclic reduction, Gauss-Seidel, ADI, multigrid, and so forth that we talked about in chapter five. All right, so those are the equations. Now let's look at the boundary conditions. So the good thing about primitive variables formulation is we're dealing with those primitive variables, velocities and pressures. We often know the velocities and we sometimes know the pressures at the boundaries, and so we can apply those directly. Let's talk through some different situations, starting with the velocity boundary conditions. So let's talk in terms of US and UN. So let's say we have a surface here that's curved. The US is tangent to the surface, and the UN is normal to that surface. So I'll just use that notation. So regardless of what the orientation of the surface is, S is along the surface tangent to it, and N is normal to the surface. So if you have a surface, obviously fluid cannot go through the surface. So you have an impermeability condition, so the normal derivative is zero. And then there's also what's called a no-slip. And what that means is the velocity right at the surface, the fluid particles right at the surface, do not move. They go at the same speed as the surface itself. So if the surface isn't moving, then the velocity is zero. So US is zero. So that's no slip and impermeability. Now if you have an inflow, so if you have a boundary on your domain and there's an inflow, you would need to know what are the velocity components coming in. So the normal and the tangential components.
if you have an outflow, so you have flow going on in your domain, and then there's an outlet. In some cases, you can argue that the flow is what's called fully developed. So for example, if you had a long duct or a long pipe, by the time you get to the end of the pipe, you will have what's called a fully developed flow. And what that means is, in the direction of the flow, so the normal direction, nothing is changing. And that's not appropriate for all outflows, but in some cases that's a good boundary condition. Another possibility would be symmetry. So if you have symmetry in your geometry that leads to a symmetry in the flow, then you only have to compute half the flow field and you can use a symmetry boundary to essentially mirror that solution. If you have a symmetry plane, then there's no flow across the symmetry plane and the partial us partial n, so the normal derivative of the tangential component would also be zero. That just means that the velocity profile at a symmetry line has to be flat. It has to have a zero slope, otherwise it wouldn't be symmetric. Okay, now what about pressure? Now if you have an outlet, sometimes the outlet is too atmospheric, you know the pressure in that situation. You might know the pressure at an inlet because you know where that flow is coming from. But what about the pressure at a solid surface? What is that? How can we get that? Well, we don't know what it is offhand, but we could get it from the momentum equation. So if you go back to equation 7, 1 and 7, 2 and apply them at a surface where us and un are both zero, so a lot of those terms go away, then if n is in the x direction, so that means you have a vertical surface, then all you're left with in the x momentum equation is partial p partial x is equal to 1 over Reynolds number times partial squared u partial x squared. All the other terms go away because of no slip and impermeability. And so if you know the u velocity, you can use this as a Neumann boundary condition to calculate the pressure. Likewise, if you have a horizontal boundary, so the normal direction is y, then all you're left with from the y momentum equation is partial p partial y is 1 over the Reynolds number times partial squared v partial y squared. Once again, if you know v, you can evaluate the right-hand side, and then you get your Neumann boundary condition for the normal derivative of the pressure. Okay, now that's just a snapshot of some of the various types of boundary conditions. There are other situations that we may need to consider in the future, but this gives us a good starting point. In the next video, I'm going to talk about the vorticity stream function formulation. So vorticity and stream function are not primitive variables, but they are valuable variables that we like to look at in fluid mechanics and we can actually reformulate the Navier-Stokes equations, the same governing equations as we have here, in terms of those variables, and we'll see some advantages in doing that in the incompressible case in the next video.